tonight. Don't be discouraged. Uh, that in the news is tough. I understand that, but it, we need to hear it. We need to hear all of it because we're in a, in a world that has fallen. But you and I are not fallen. You and I are saved. And you and I have promises that the world cannot latch onto. They can if they want to, but they don't. So as we continue with this study in Genesis, let me remind you that the Genesis study, I've been hearing it from people that have been, that have been ex excited about the study, is building faith in a lot of people. So please stay with us if you're listening to the news because the good news is here. Uh, we're going to talk about Genesis. Tonight will be chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In Genesis chapter 1, we cover the six days of creation. You remember that? Day 1, light and earth. Do, day 2, separate waters above and the waters below. Day 3, dry land and plants. Day 4, sun, moon, planets, and stars. Day 5, flying and sea creatures. Day 6, land animals and man. Chapter 1 is similar to a heading in, the pap in, the, in a paper. So this is not a complete understanding of how God did it because he's going to now give us details in chapter 2. Specific details of God's creation, specifically of man in his world. In chapter 2, we will see the specific creation of woman also. Let's go to chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. The completion of creation. The seventh day of creation. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he has done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So let's, let's take this apart. Let's take this Genesis study tonight apart. As every night, I dive deep into Genesis so that you have the truth and the meat of God's word. The Bible says God rested on the seventh day. Does God need to rest? Does he get tired? Absolutely not. The original Hebrew word is Shabbat. We get our word Sabbath from it. And it's not because God was tired. The word actually means to stop and to celebrate. A Shabbat or Sabbath is you stop what you're doing and you celebrate. He had rested not because he was tired, but because he was stopping and celebrating what he had made. He rested to show that his creative work was finished and he celebrated it. Just think about that for a moment. The seventh, seven day week is permanently ingrained in man all over the world. How do we get a seven, a seven day week? Even during the French Revolution when they tried to change it to a 10 day week, it was attempted, but it failed to catch on. We are on a seven day cycle because God is on a seven day cycle. The word finished here is the Hebrew word kala, and it means to cease from creating. Legalists miss the true meaning of the Sabbath. Seventh-day Adventists believe worshiping on Sunday, as most of us do, is the mark of the beast. And that's hogwash for lots of biblical reasons. The Sabbath is a shadow and type of Jesus. It's not something that, that is, you have to strictly do this. It's a shadow and type of Jesus. Jews were to enter into it for rest. Jesus fulfilled it when we enter into him for rest. He is the Sabbath. He is our rest. Look, Colossians spells it out beautifully. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. If you don't, if you don't, Paul's saying to, to believers, Gentile believers, Christian believers, or Jewish believers, he's saying, don't let anybody, don't let anybody judge you because you missed the festival or you missed the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come. But the substance is of Christ. He's saying Sabbaths and festivals, they're about Christ. That's a shadow and type of Christ. It's, it's, you can't say, I, I went to church every Sunday, so I'm going to go to heaven. No, that has nothing to do with it. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's good to go, but it's not, that's not something that assures you. It's resting in Christ. So, yes, we should have a day of rest. But what day is it is isn't the issue. Resting in Jesus is every day. In Jesus, God has a perpetual rest, a Sabbath for his people. Hebrews tells us that. There, remain there, there remains therefore a rest, Paul says, to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did for his, from his. So we see that it's, that's, that's what it is. So we know that there's that rest that comes. Look, Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 to 7 goes further. The history of the heavens and the earth. And if you're really reading this, and I really read the word, every word, and I analyze it, I found something right in the beginning of this that kind of made me think, and I'll, I'll teach you tonight. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Did you notice it switched? Heavens and the earth now become earth and heavens. Why? The Holy Spirit, I'll tell you why. The Holy Spirit did that for a reason. Before any plant of the field was in the earth, before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Remember the canopy? There was no rain on the earth. 
a mist came up. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Man, we're going to take apart that word dust here in a moment. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. No other animal or creation of God ever became a living soul on planet Earth. Ever. So, the word finished here is kalah. And again, it means ceasing for creating. And I want you to know the Sabbath is a shadow of Jesus. Colossians tells us that it is. And God has a perpetual rest, as Hebrews tells us. But notice in Genesis 2, 47, the placement of the words, the earth and the heavens. Now, God made the earth and the heavens. It switched from Genesis 1, 1, where it says God created the heavens and the earth. Why? Because God will now center his concern earthward toward man, revealing himself more and more through the pages of his word. That Bible that you read, that Bible that I have, every single part of that Bible is trying to, re trying to give us more and more understanding of who God is. He reveals more and more of his name. There are certain people that lived the antediluvians didn't know certain names for God. You and I do. So it's to, it's to reveal himself to man. Over 11,000 times the name of God in one form or another is mentioned in Scripture. So, although God creates a myriad, a cornucopia of life on planet Earth, He's now centering all of that creative, creative genius toward His greatest creation ever, man, you and me. And it's here in Genesis 2.5 that God, Elohim, of Genesis chapter 1, starts to reveal His many natures and acts towards man by giving man another name he would be known by. It's the very first time we see the name Lord in Scripture. It's the word Yahweh in the Hebrew. Uh, let me show you this word. The Lord God. In the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. That's the very first time it's mentioned. This is the first use of Lord, Yahweh, in the Bible. Our English word Lord comes from our Anglo-Saxon word for bread, as that our word for loaf. Because ancient English men of high stature would keep a continual open house where all could come and get bread to eat. They gained the honorable title of Lords, meaning dispensers of bread. Man, is that not powerful and perfect for God? God is the dispenser of the bread of life, the word of God. And so he's keeping a total open house. That's why we call him Lord. So the word, the bread of life, opens all. God in his word has just familiarized us with his ability to create. We have three words to review his full creation. Three words, and here they are. He, God's review. Astronomy, he created the heavens and all the stars. Agronomy, he created the earth and the plants. And anthropology, now he creates man. And the word says that God formed man. In the Hebrew, that's the word yatsar, formed. You want to see it again in scripture? It's translated another way right here in Isaiah. Will the clay say to the yatsar, potter, what are you doing? The word formed is this yatsar. It's the same as the word potter. Boy, it pulls the Bible together, doesn't it? God formed you just like somebody with formed clay. He shaped you as a great architect, as somebody that was, that was making a model. He shaped man. Isaiah 5.9 tells us that. The word potter there, again, is the same word as formed in Genesis 2.7, Yetzar. There's a oneness here. The creator of the human body is a product, the creation of the human body is a product of God's direct activity. Everything else God created was spoken into existence. But God personally put his hand on us. He formed us. Not just with his word, but with his hands. It's an intimacy. And God has never stopped placing his hands on the human heart that follows him. Which brings me to our physical makeup tonight. Okay? Let's get scientific for a moment. And let's get scientific on the making of man. Here we are. Elements used in creating man. You are 42 kilograms of water, gly glycosin, glycogen, phosphorus, calcium, fat 12 kilograms, protein 12 kilograms, sodium, potassium, and then magnesium, chloride, iron, zinc, and uh, CU, I forgot what that was, um, copper. So this is who we are. This is the physical elements in our body. Let me put it another way. Here's our, here are the elements you need to make a man. You want to make a man tonight? The average 180 pound man, you need 58 pounds of oxygen, 50 quarts of water, 24 pounds of potassium, charcoal, three pounds, pounds of calcium, which is lime, uh, fat, seven bars of soap, that's your fat, 10 ounces of sulfur, which is gunpowder, 10 ounces of chlorine, excuse me, that was chlorine. Six ounces of magnesium, which you could get from fertilizer. Six ounces of iron, you can get that anywhere. Five ounces of glycerin, which you could get with antifreeze. Four ounces of potassium, get some baking powder. Phosphorus, matches, two ounces of salt. 
You and I could take all the elements right now. I could put it together on this table. And remember, most of these are in my house right now. And we can make a man, can we not? That's what we're made of. That's everything we're made of. These are the common ingredients you need to make a man. All found in or on the earth. Isn't it amazing to you that Genesis tells us man was formed from the earth? Not some extraterrestrial created being like angels or anything else. And then science 10,000 years later confirms our makeup as roughly the same compounds as the earth's crust and atmosphere. These are compounds of the earth. We are made from these compounds. Scientists tells us we are. Today you can collect all the ingredients without any trouble. The only problem is with the instructions. You see the human body is so complex that no Frankensteinian scientist alive or dead can fathom more than just a tiny fraction of its composition and molecular arrangement. Science still can't figure out why we have an appendix or a gallbladder. Matter of fact, you can live without several things. Several body organs that you can live without. You don't need your spleen. Other lymphoid tissues in the body help with the immune functions of the spleen when it's taken out. You don't even need your stomach, believe it or not. When the stomach is removed, surgeons detach the esophagus gullet directly to the small intestine. Bypass surgery does that. Reproductive organs, believe it or not, interesting in some male populations, removal of both testicles may lead to an increase in life expectancy. Colon, you just need to be on a soft food diet, you don't need it. Gallbladder, the liver skips the needed need for bile storage. Appendix, removal does not affect anything in your body. And your kidneys, you can live without your kidneys if you're on dialysis. So, we can live without those. So why the, and why the complex structure of bones? Scientists don't understand why the complex structure of the three bones that are in your ear. Just consider these facts. Infants are born with approximately 300, 300 bones. But as they grow, some of these bones fuse together. By the time they reach adulthood, they have about 206 bones, which every one of us has. How about location? More than half of your bones are located in your hands, your wrists, your feet, and your ankles. Cells, over 100 of them. Cells. Every second, your body produces 25 million new cells. That means in 15 seconds, you will have produced more cells than there are people in the United States. How about bone sizes? The largest bone in the human body is the femur, also known as the thigh bone. The smallest bone is the stirrup bone, which is located inside your eardrum. How about blood vessels? I'm trying to read the small print, bear with me. There is anywhere between 60,000 and 100,000 miles of blood vessels in the human body. If they were taken out and put end to end, they would be, there would be enough so that you could travel around the world more than 30 times, I think that says. Three times, excuse me. Teeth. Teeth are considered part of the skeletal system, but are not counted as bones. Brain. Despite accounting for 25% of our body mass, the brain uses 20% of our oxygen and blood supply. How about running? While humans are not the biggest, fastest, or the strongest animals around, we are the best at something. Long distance running. Water. You're about 60% water of your body is made up of water. Strong bones. Pound for pound, your bones are stronger than steel. A block of bone the size of a, of a matchbox can support up to 18,000 pounds of weight. It's an amazing, amazing creation, our body. Let me give you a little bit more. A mere piece of your skin, probably the size of a postage stamp, has three million cells, three feet of blood vessels, 12 feet of nerves, 100 sweat glands, 25 nerve endings, 15 oil glands. And that's just a little piece the size of a postage stamp. And evolutionists want us all to believe all of these materials came together by mere chance in the exact way, in the exact way to allow humans to have life. Yeah, right. That's like believing that an explosion in a printing plant resulted in the printing of Webster's Unabridged Dictionary word for word. Just imagine for a moment with me the vessel you're living in that God created and given us. And bear with me. I'm giving the physical. We're going to get to the spiritual in a moment. Just imagine in just the last 24 hours for an average person, your heart beat 103,689 times. Your blood traveled 168 million miles in the last 24 hours. You breathed 23,040 times. You inhaled 438 cubic feet of air. That's six foot football fields long, six football fields wide, and two football fields high. You ate three and a half pounds of food. Some of us ate more. You drank three quarts of liquid. You lost seven eighths pounds of waste. You spoke 15,000 words, including some unnecessary ones. You moved 750 muscles. 
your nails grew 0 0.00046 of an inch. That's, that's a uh, hundred thousandths of an inch. You engaged and exercised 7 million brain cells in just 24 hours. So let's forget the how God orchestrated this because none of us will ever understand that. Let's talk about the why. Why did God form man? Why did he form me? Did he form you to eat more? To talk more? To think more? To explore the latest fashions? To see how many ways that you can use your muscles? Matthew 26, 6.25. So I tell you to stop worrying about what you will eat, drink, or wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? Jesus said it. Genesis 2.7 continues by telling us that the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground. That lines up with the elements I shared with you that make up our bodies. But that word dust doesn't need to be passed over lightly when we are studying why and how God made man. With all the race cards being played today in politics and the secular media, especially between blacks and whites, it's important to know what that word dust is translated as. Was Adam black? Was he white? Was he brown? Was he yellow? Was he red? It's a pretty big that's a pretty big question. I remember preaching in white churches and they had images of Jesus and he was white. I remember preaching in black churches and they had images of Jesus and he was black. I remember seeing pictures of Adam in black churches where he was black. Pictures of, of Adam in white churches where he was white. So what was Adam? Was he white? Was he black? Brown? Yellow? Red? Well, you've got to love what I'm going to share with you in a moment. For me, it settles the race card once and for all. You see, you're going to love this. Man was made from gray dust. Gray. The Lord for a man of the dust. Hebrew is afar. It means gray of the ground. When God created man, he made him out of the most basic elements, the dust of the ground, gray dust. There is nothing spectacular in what man is made of, only in the way those basic things are organized. So, not black, not white, not red, not yellow, not brown, gray. Wow, talk about leveling the playing field. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Can you imagine God cupping his hands over Adam's face after he formed it and breathing into him? And he becomes a living being. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. With this divine breath, man became a living being. The term kainethesh is used. Yet only man is a living being made in the image of God. The word to breathe, for breathe in Hebrew is ruach. The word imitates the sound, the very sound of your breath, ruach. It is the same word for the spirit as in the case of both ancient Greek, pneuma, and Latin, spiritus. God created man by putting his breath, his breath, his spirit within him. Think about the creation of man. And evolution has the nerve to tell us that we come from an ape, has the nerve to tell us we come from some primordial soup. You are, spe I get chills, you are specially created by God with the breath of God. The implication readily seen by any Hebrew reader is that man was specially created by God's breathing some of his own breath into him. The only thing that has the breath of God in it today is man. Just let your head rest on that for a moment. Again, God is centering his creative genius on planet Earth and man. In our world today, there's a great deal of talk about aliens and alien encounters. I get questions all the time. UFOs, now called UAPs by NASA. Unidentified aerial phenomenon like this. A picture made from one of the fighter jet pilots. So there's a lot of talk about it. Um, NASA's independent study on UAPs came back on September 14th, 2023, and it came back empty. No alien crafts. It was accounted as planes, balloons, drones, weather events, and I'll add demons to that. No, we are alone on planet Earth. You could throw out all the movies of, and myths like Alien and Predator and E.T. and The Abyss and Edge of Tomorrow and Close Encounters and Independence Day and War of the Worlds and The Day the Earth Stood Still and Men in Black and Contact and Area 51 and Dead Alien Bodies and God breathed His life breath only into us. Only into us. I believe all this preoccupation with aliens is a setup for explaining in secular terms what happens when millions of us will be taken off planet Earth in the rapture. The world will explain it away as those undesirables, those Christians, were taken away by aliens in order to correct life on the earth. But look, we alone have the breath of God. We alone were fashioned by his hands. We alone have the spirit of God breathed into us at creation. In conclusion tonight, I want us to focus on the fact that there is more to our lives than the weather, than the back and forth of politics, than the wayward culture, 
than the latest breaking news, than the latest fashions, and than what's waiting for us tomorrow. Look at Matthew 6.25 one more time. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink. Remember Jesus saying it. Nor yet for your body what you shall put on is not life more than meat and the body more than raiment. By the way, the word for thought is the Greek word merimneo. And it doesn't mean don't care. It doesn't mean ignore what you eat or wear or ignore the news. It literally means don't be anxious about. Don't fret over. When I see you in the news, it's not for you to fret over. It's not for you to obsess about. It's not for you to worry about and get anxious. Jesus tells us in Matthew, don't be obsessed. Don't, get, don't worry about anything. Wow. Do we need to hear that tonight or what? Jesus is telling us, don't worry. Don't obsess over what you eat, what you wear, by extension, what you hear in the news, what's happening in politics. Be aware, yes, but don't make these things your main concern in life. Why? Because the God that made you, the God that formed you, the God that breathed his breath in you will, I say will, will take care of you. And all you have to do is seek the kingdom of God, seek his righteousness. How do I know that? Therefore I say unto you, it goes on, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body which shall put on is not life more than meat, the body more than raiment. Behold, look, the fowls of the air, they don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you much better than them? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall he eat, or what shall we drink, or whether shall he be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, the ones who don't know God. For your Heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. I'm not saying don't think about them. God's going to take care of you. But here's what he says. But first, before you seek any of those things, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I think about everything that's pumped us from Hollywood and from sports. Uh, a um, pro baseball player recently signed up in his contract for $700 million. I don't even know what you do with $700 million. You see some of the football players and their massive their massive houses and their mansions and two, three, four of them. And Jesus said, you know, why are you thinking about all that stuff? You know, God will take care of you. What do you need? You, need, you don't need the things that you put on and that you wear and you live in. You need something more. There's something more that God created you not just to wear the latest fashion. Great, if you could do that and afford it, wonderful. It's not the reason why God created you. He created you for something else. And the God that made you, that he formed you, is going to take care of you. And all you have to do, again, is seek the kingdom of God and seek righteousness. And everything you're concerned about, God will take care of. That's a promise from Jesus. However, God does in the New Testament tell us what to do with these mortal body, bodies we have. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? The Holy Spirit lives in us. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives in your body. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Jesus paid it. Therefore, honor God with your body. Simply put, it's this. Take care of yourself. Eat right. Exercise. Get plenty of sleep. Stop stressing. And most of all, fill yourself up with the right things. I put a little chart in there. That the Bible tells us to be filled with. Filling ourselves with the right things. Number one, be filled with righteousness. Doing the right thing. Be filled with the fullness of the Spirit. Ask the Spirit to be with you all the time. Be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Be filled with His joy. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. By the way, be filled with righteousness. Matthew 5, 6 tells us that. Filled with the fruits of the Spirit, fullness of the Spirit or fruits of the Spirit. Philippians 1, 1, Galatians 5, 23. Be filled with the knowledge of God's will. It means read His Word. Colossians 1, 9. Be filled with His joy. 2 Timothy 1, 4. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. Acts 9, 17. Several years ago, I attended a ministerial conference in Indianapolis, Indiana. It's a beautiful city. Here is its center. It's absolutely gorgeous. One of the most beautiful cities center cities I've ever seen. And I picked up an independent, the Independence Times, which had headlines that day that said this, slums come in posh surroundings. It explained how, with public funds, a high-rise apartment building was built near the center city. It's to the right, upper right of that picture. That's the high-rise apartment building that was built 
with public friends. They were built for low income housing. It looks beautiful from a distance and from the outside, like the picture shows, but the article went on to say that the families uh, living inside have knocked the holes in the walls, torn fixtures out of this and sold them, used the marble bathtubs for storing junk, flung garbage out the windows to the streets below, and the article ended with a warning to stay away from this area with its beautiful outside amenities. The article ended with four words. What can we do? It hit me after reading it that the authorities of Indianapolis who funded this project made one huge mistake. They had changed the homes but not the hearts of the slum dwellers. It's a common error still played out in major U.S. cities today as all the refugees come. Change the environment, they think, and you'll change the person. That's simply not true. We need only one thing to change what's inside those homes. We need to change hearts. God's creation of man, all men, is absolutely beautiful. But what's inside those bodies God created is the main issue. You and I were meant to house God himself to be a living, breathing temple of the Holy Spirit, filled with righteousness, filled with fruits of the Spirit, filled with knowledge of God's Word, filled with His joy, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Let me remind you, God gave you everything you need to fulfill your destiny. I want to encourage you tonight to seek the things of God so you can fulfill your God-given destiny. Let's pray. Father, tonight, as we study Genesis, we pray, Lord God, that we are able to take in and be filled with what you've told us to be filled with. Lord, you breathed your breath into us. You touched us. You molded us and breathed your breath into us. Your intention was for us to be filled with the Spirit. And Lord, tonight we want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with righteousness, filled with the fruits of the Spirit, filled with the knowledge of your will, with your joy. And yes, Lord, again, with your Holy Spirit. Lord, fill us now tonight. I pray that you fill everyone that's here, Lord. I know the Word has already filled us up tonight as we studied it. Now, Lord God, let the joy come into our lives, no matter what we're going through, Lord God. Let the fruits, love, peace, joy, long-suffering, meekness, mildness, temperance, again, such there is no law, Lord. Let that come into our being, Lord God. And Lord, tonight, I pray that we would have your righteousness, Lord, that we would seek the right things to do as we live our lives. And we will know that the breath of God continues to be with us. Bless us now, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Before I let you go tonight, let me tell you that next week, we're gonna talk about the tree of life in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And you will learn a great deal. And we will talk about the actual physical location of the Garden of Eden. Where is it? And the creation of Eve. God bless you. I hope you have a great Valentine's Day. It's great being with you.